Okay, we've been looking at what modern Muslim scholars have been saying about the Quran and what uh, and how they've elevated it so high, and, and then we looked at what the earlier traditions, the ninth and tenth century tradition scholars, uh, those who were writing the Hadith, uh, what they said about the Quran, and we're seeing there's a real disconnect between what they're saying today and what they used to say. It's obvious that in the earlier days, the Muslims did not consider the Quran as that in, inimitable. They did not have this preservation, this need for uh, a preservation. And I think the reason why is because many of them knew exactly how the Quran was still being put together, was still being created. So there was not the same view that Muslim scholars today had back then. Proving that it's nothing more than a man-made book. And uh, that seems to be the consensus from what an awful lot of what we just looked at. Now we want to go to another area that really proves that this is man-made, and that concerns the historical anachronisms. If this really had been a book that was eternal, as chapter 85.22 says, uh, if this is also a book that was well guarded by Allah and preserved, uh, as it says in chapter 10, verse 15, in chapter 15, verse 9, and also in chapter 18, verse 27, then it would stand to reason that this book would have no errors in it. It would be, well, inimitable. The, the word that Muslims are always quoting to me. And there would be no errors as far as history, as far as science, and any other area. So let's go look at some of the historical anachronisms, because this area specifically is a problem. Since we're looking at the historical problems of the Quran, this one is a problem, because there are historical errors in the Quran, which God would not make. Man would but not God. Okay? So, come with me, and let's unpack them. Let's take a look at some of the historical inaccuracies or anachronisms there in the Quran. When you open the Quran, you will see in chapter 20, verse 85 to 87, and then also 95 to 97, that when Mo Moses goes up to uh, Mount Sinai, a Samedi, a means a Samaritan, builds the golden calf. And it's very clear that this was a Samaritan because Moses said to him, and what is your case, O Samedi, O Samaritan? The problem is there were no Samaritans in 1400 BC. Samaritans were not created until the fall of the northern kingdom by Israel uh, by Sargon II. And that was in 722 BC. So how can you have Samaritans existing 700 years earlier? It gets a moss in, uh, much too early. Remember we talked about this moss last night. That's the Dome of the Rock and there's the Alexa Mosque. One was built in 691. The other was built in 710. In chapter 17, verse 1 of the Quran, it talks about the Masjid al-Haram and the Masjid al-Aqsa, but it talks about from the great mosque to the farthest mosque, assuming that therefore that is referring to the Miraj that I referred to last night where Muhammad went from Mecca up to Jerusalem. The farthest mosque would be in Jerusalem. The difficulty is there were no Muslims in Jerusalem. Muslims didn't get to Jerusalem until at least... Uh, Six, what, what do I have here? Six, well, 650, 649 to 650. So you, you see, they're already they've got, they've got Muslims in the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. It cannot be the temple they're referring to because that was destroyed in 70 AD. In chapter 34, verse 10 to 11 of the Quran, it says, it talks about David and that he was to make full coats of mail and circulate precisely the links, meaning, meaning uh, chain mail. Yet David lived in 1000 BC. There was no chain mail. They didn't have that technology in 1000 BC. Coats of chain mail were not invented until 200 BC, 800 years later. It misplaces crucifixions too early. In the story of Pharaoh and Moses, the sorcerers who could not keep up with Pharaoh, uh, sorry, with Moses, they were taken out and they were crucified. That's in 1400 BC. You see that in Surah 7, Ayah 120 to 124, and in chapter 20, verse 71. In the story of Joseph, which is in 1800 BC, again, a pharaoh takes the baker and crucifies him. You can't have crucifixions that early, because crucifixions were not introduced until 500 BC. They were not ever used in Egypt as well. Thus, crucifix, uh, the Quran's crucifixions are in the wrong place, and they're about 1,000 to 1,300 years too early. Now, the one place it should have got the crucifixion right, it gets it wrong. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ. 
He was not crucified according to Surah 4, Ayah 157. Yet when you take a look at all the historical material from the first century, look at the historians who had referred to that crucifixion. You have Thallus and Phlegon who are debating it in 52 AD, just 20 years after the event. You have Tacitus who hated Christians. He was talking about it. Even he, he is the one that tells that it happened during the time of Pontius Pilate while uh, Tiberius was emperor, proving that it had to happen in 33 AD. That's why we get the date for the crucifixion. He was a Roman historian. Josephus, a Jewish historian, talks about the crucifixion, mentions not only that Jesus was crucified, but then it goes on to say that the Christians believe he rose again. So there is a Greek historian, Roman historian, and Jewish historian all talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Why did the Quran get it so wrong? And it's got the wrong Mary. In chapter 19, verse 28, it says, Mary, you have certainly done a thing unprecedented, O sister of Aaron. So Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the sister of Aaron. In chapter 66, verse 12, the same Mary, who is the mother of Jesus, is the daughter of Imran, who is the father of Aaron. And in chapter 20, verse 30, Aaron has a brother named Moses. So both Aaron and Moses, who are the sons of Imran, which is the biblical Amran, have a sister named Miriam who is the mother of Jesus. Do you see a problem with that? Especially when you know that Aaron and Moses did have a sister named Miriam. They were all three the children of Amran, but they lived in 1400 BC. Mary lived in the first century, unless she was a very old Mary. And it confuses the Qibla and the Kaaba. We saw that last night, so we won't reiterate that over again. It gets the wrong Qibla at the wrong place finally gets the right Qibla for Mecca, not till 727, and finally was not made solidified until the 800s. And then today, now you'll see them all towards Mecca. It also uh, completely confuses where the Kaaba is and does not understand that the Kaaba, it can be any place where their worship is done in many different sanctuaries. It confuses Pharaoh, the Tower of Babel, and Haman in chapter 28, verse 38, mentioning that Haman is an Egyptian, uh, chapter 40, verse 36 to 37, Pharaoh talks to Haman. The problem is Egypt never built any towers, as according to this story. They built pyramids. More than that, we know that Haman was not an Egyptian name. It is a Persian name, and we see him referred to in the story of Esther in chapter 3, verse 1. Pharaoh lived in 1500 B.C., whereas Haman, the Persian Haman, lived in 510 B.C. They never met each other because there was about a thousand years between them. Now, God would not make these kind of mistakes. Man would. And that's why I'm pointing these out to you, proving that this is all man-made. And the error we do not put at God's feet. It makes Alexander the Great an amazing engineer. In chapter 18, verse 96, he talks about, it talks about Alexander creating a wall between two mountains to keep the barbarians from getting across. This great big wall that is big enough to hold out an entire army is made out of iron and copper. Now, Alexander lived in the third century BC. That would be one of the greatest engineering events of history to say nothing of the fact that we can't even make those large walls of iron and copper even today. One of the greatest engineering feats according to the Quran by Alexander the Great. We have three biographies of Alexander. Nowhere is there any reference to this wall. And where would its residue be? And then it refuse, refers to futuristic coins. We showed these on the, on the wall, but I didn't unpack them for you. Remember it said that Joseph was sold for a few dirham counted out. Counted out means coins, am I correct? If you're counting out, there must be coins. There were no coins at the time of Joseph in 1800 BC. Coins were not invented until the 600s by the Lydians. So what coins existed at the time of Joseph, 1800 BC? And obviously, this was written long before coins, well, this was written long after coins were made and redacted back to the wrong person doing the wrong thing. But what about the Bible? Does the Bible get this wrong? When you look at Genesis 37, 28, it says that Joseph is sold for 20 shekels. A shekel is a weighted measure. 20 shekels is about 0.2% of a silver, of, of silver. When you look at the Nuzi tablets and the Mari, Mari tablets, you will see that the price of a slave exactly fits what we see in Genesis 37. We don't ask it to be correct, it just turns out to be correct. But I'm still curious about that dirham. Because dirham is a specific coin. It's the name of a coin. Did, I, did you see, remember last night, when were the dirhams introduced? They were introduced in 661. 
there were no dirhams before 661 because all the Arabs would have used drachmas, either Greek drachmas or Byzantine drachmas. They took the drachmas and then they introduced their own coins in 661. Remember they took the, em the emperor's image off and put the caliph's image instead? You saw those last night? Which means there could be no dirhams before 661. So how could they be in a Quran referred to by a man who died in 632? That's 30 years too early. Ooh, I love that. Unless, of course, Muhammad was prophetic. <laughs> so when you look at these anachronisms, what we notice is the authors of the Quran do not seem to know history very well. God would not make these kind of mistakes. Man would. This is further proof that the Quran includes intentionally human interventions. Well, you can see, I, I don't want to go into belabor the point. We could have gone and done quite a few new uh, historical anachronisms. I think just those few examples are good enough to prove to you that the, wh whoever wrote the Quran did not know their history well. And it's obvious that they introduced Samaritans, they introduced mosques, chainmail, uh, also crucifixions and dirham coins way too early. And then they introduced the Qibla and the Kaaba in Mecca way too late. Uh, they suggest that Alexander the Great was a great, amazing engineer being able to make this huge wall of iron and copper between two mountains, one of the greatest engineering feats of any day. Even today that would be an engineering feat, yet there's no record of this whatsoever. Confuses the Old Testament and New Testament Marys, uh, as well as Pharaoh, uh, Egypt, with that uh, of... Persia, the Tower of Babel, and also Haman. Got, got the wrong name, the wrong person. He's not an Egyptian, he's a Persian. And this suggests that either the authors of the Quran did not know their history well, or they borrowed these stories from other sources, and I think it's the latter. They probably borrowed these stories, and that's why they got the, the other sources with, and, uh, they, uh, with little discretion on their part as to what they were borrowing. Either way, what we do know, and what this suggests to me very clearly, is that this is not a book from God. Uh, this is not a book from any God that I know. I, we don't have these problems in the, the Bible like this. This is why it's beautiful that when you have reference after reference in the Bible that talks about historical events. In fact, when you look at the Bible, we don't claim that it was eternally preserved or sent down, the Bible itself. And yet, when you look at the Bible, we don't have these problems. So much so that when I was in Britain, we put together this uh, this Bible in the British Museum tour, and I would take people around, and uh, uh, Beth Peltola now does that in Britain, so does Hatun Tash, uh, Sarah Lumgar are the ones who take this tour, and, and if you're interested and you're in London, look them up and they'll take you the tour, because what is fascinating, God bless the British, everywhere they went, they stole things and they brought it back to the British Museum so we could look at it, and there's such a treasure trove of artifacts in the British Museum. There's stellas, there's obelisks, there's murals, there are uh, the tablets, all these tablets, amazing number of tablets that support the Babylonian period, that support the Assyrian period, and also the patriarchal period. Fascinating. And goes up into the Persian period. And what's great about it, when you look at all these artifacts, you realize uh, that the Bible, though they've tried to throw everything at it, <laughs> all kinds of accusations about supposed historical inaccuracies, and yet you look and see what the archaeologists say on the Bible. And I, I'm not going to read them all because this, this is over 21 pages, but let me just end with one quote from Nelson Gluck, a, a Jewish Reformed scholar and archaeologist, well of note, says, probably he gives us probably the greatest support for the Bible when he states this, To date, no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a single properly understood biblical statement. Let me repeat that. To date, no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a single properly understood biblical statement. So when you t look at these two books and you ask about historical anachronisms, I've just showed you a number of historical anachronisms that we've found in the Quran, and it's t we could have gone to many, many more. I think those are enough to show you that this is really a man-made book uh, with man-made errors. Uh, man does make errors. God does not. This is a man-made book as well. I would expect it, therefore, to be full of inaccuracies. Yet we can't find any. We aren't able to. And this is one reason why I know an awful lot of people will jump on me and say, how dare you say that, the, you know, th this idea of superlative. And I don't mean to make it a superlative, but it's fascinating that this book does have the right people at the right place, doing the right thing at the right time. Not so in the Quran. And that's why this is yet just another proof that the Quran is not inimitable, not well-preserved, full of inaccuracies, including historical 
anachronism. So, okay, we'll leave it there. Uh, we'll go into the next area on source criticism. This is Jathan. Over now. God bless you.